Hello, I'm Cleve Powell, and I'm going to be talking about the milkweeds of Guadalupe County for the Guadalupe Master Gardeners. All right, let's get started. As with you know any kind of plant, the main characteristics that are defining are the flowers and the fruit. So uh, milkweeds have a rather unique flower. Their anthers and their stigma have become fused to form what botanists call a gynostegium. It's this little uh, projection that sticks up in the middle of the flower right there. And, you know, if a little bug wants to get in there and grab the pollen, they're going to have to reach inside and grab the pollen. The hoods are another part of a milkweed flower that most uh, other flowers don't have. They're these little projections that stick up on either side of uh, the gynostegium. And there's five of them generally, and uh, five petals as well. Most of the time, the petals are small and reflexed. On this particular specimen, this is a antelope horn milkweed, one of the common milkweeds of Guadalupe County. They're reflexed, but they're also rather large. So they, you know, kind of cup around the hoods and, uh, you know, are, make the flower kind of showy since they have, uh, you know, a little bit larger. Uh, cream colored look to them. And so, you know, when those are all in bloom, they make this nice little hemisphere of uh, flowers. Uh, looks really nice. And I chose this particular one because it's rather unique. If you notice, this flower right here has six hoods and six uh, petals. So it's a little genetic abnormality. Looks kind of cool, but, uh, you know, milkweeds are always doing weird things. The other two things that make milkweeds unique are their fruit. The fruit are called follicles. Uh, a follicle is just a pod that splits open along one side. And then in milkweeds, the seeds all have these little silks attached to them. So when the follicle splits, the silks catch the wind and the seeds are dispersed, you know, wherever the wind might blow them. When they uh, hit the ground, the seeds detach from the silks and the seed just falls into the, onto the soil and then eventually it will sprout, hopefully, if all goes well. The other uh, unique feature of milkweeds, or not necessarily unique, but rather unique, uh, is this milky sap. There are other plants that have milky white sap, but milkweeds also have the milky white sap. And uh, this is kind of a uh, physical defense for the plant. Little insects that try to eat the leaves or the stems you know, their little mouth parts will get gummed up with the sticky sap if they're not, uh, if they're not careful. Uh, and so any, you know, bug that tries to eat that has to overcome that additional physical requirement of being able to deal with the sap. Uh, they also produce a slight toxin called the cardiac glycoside, which is a neurotoxin. Uh, and so like if you were, say, a bug, just like a random bug trying to eat a milkweed, and you ate uh, too much of the plant, it would it would kill the bugs. It's not really toxic to humans. You'd have to consume too much of it uh, to kill you. So they're not they're not necessarily toxic to humans or ma like large mammals. But the taste is really bad. So cows and goats probably won't eat the the leaves, and so they don't die from it they, because it's just nasty. But what's cool about the insects is that the insects that have uh, the ability to eat milkweed is they take that cardiac glycoside into their own body and they incorporate it into their own tissues. And so then they become poisonous or at least nasty tasting to their predators. So like a, say a caterpillar that can eat milkweed uh, will taste really bad to a bird. And so if a bird were to eat it, the bird would throw it up almost immediately just because it's a nasty, nasty little caterpillar. <laughs> so milkweeds are kind of a cool little plant. And, you know, you might think that they're kind of rare, but as the name suggests, they're weeds. And so they're really actually all around us. Uh, they're just sometimes hard to spot unless you know what you're looking for. And so after this, hopefully you'll know what you're looking for. I'm going to talk about several milkweeds now, and I'm going to go from kind of the most common down to ones that are a little bit less common down to rare uh, in Guadalupe County. So probably the most common milkweed in Guadalupe County is Zazote milkweed. And I've got, you know, both names on here. So Zazotes is the common name. It's short for Zazote, or Herba de Zazotes, 
which is the full uh, Spanish common name. But most uh, people just call it cizotes in Texas. It also has the kind of English common name of side cluster milkweed, but nobody really calls it that. Everyone calls it cizotes. And then the binomial name for it is Asclepius anathroides. So Asclepius is the genus of milkweeds. All of the milkweeds that the monarch uh, lays its eggs on are in the genus Asclepius. So milkweeds that grow from Mexico all the way up into Canada, they're all Asclepius. And then Cizotes milkweed, its species name is Anathroides because its leaves have this interesting uh, margin here that's kind of wavy. So in the spring, before it blooms, and when it's mixed in with the grass, it looks kind of like uh, primrose leaves. So the that's where the common name or the the species name for Anathroides comes from. It means looks like Anothera, which is the genus name for primroses. A little interesting tidbit there. I don't know if it's interesting, but uh, I've got uh, two maps here. One of them you can see is a larger map, and that one comes from the USDA plant database. And each one of those counties with, that's highlighted in green is a county that has a record of Asclepius anathroides growing in it. So some herbaria out there has a record of uh, Asclepius taken from that county. So you can see it's a rather widespread plant in Texas and goes up to Oklahoma and over to Colorado and into New Mexico, but it's kind of a southwestern milkweed. And then on the left here, we've got a county map of Guadalupe County, and this one's taken from iNaturalist, which is, if you don't know about it, it's a really cool app. You can get it on your phone and you take pictures of plants and animals and you upload it to the app and then experts can get on there and ID them. And so each one of these little dots here that you see is a, a, another record of Asclepius and Athroides or Zazote milkweed in Guadalupe County. So this is kind of like in real time. This is kind of historical. Where would you expect to find them? And this is ones that have actually been found growing live in your county. So you can see it grows pretty much all over the county from the east to the west. A lot of it's right here in the central part, uh, but it's a it's a widespread plant, and it's probably the most common uh, milkweed that's growing out in uh, Guadalupe County, you know, right now. And right now it's blooming. So if you were to go out there, you'd see the little flowers, and then its pods will be ripe around August. And then if we have a rainy fall, it'll produce a second round of flowers and a second round of fruit around, you know, maybe beginning of October. So depending on when the rains come, they can also, they can produce up to three crops of pods a year, one in the spring, one in the summer, and one in the fall, depending on the rainfall. Mine this year did not produce one in the spring because we had kind of a dry spring. Uh, mine are blooming right now, which might mean that I get a couple uh, pods around uh, the end of August. So this is one that you can collect again this year. So their uh, leaves, when you know, before the pod starts, they're pretty distinctive. They're covered in a fine hair. They have these wavy uh, leaf margins, and then they're uh, opposite, and then they go kind of like opposite from each other. Uh, and so when you see them growing out in the field, not a lot of other things look like them. One thing that I've noticed that looks kind of like them is silver leaf nightshade. If you know what that looks like, that one's got alternate leaves. That's the main difference there, and its leaves have thorns on it. But if you kind of know what that looks like, you can kind of get a search image for that. And when you see zazotes, you'll start seeing them everywhere with these little opposite leaves that kind of come right out from the stem. Uh, their follicles are rather smooth, kind of bumpy. But uh, as far as that goes, they're rather long, you know, maybe about this long. Let me see there, about that long. Uh, and they have the gentle curve to them. And the plants stand maybe a foot and a half tall. They generally have... Uh, multiple stems on one plant and when you see the fluff break out that's when you know the pods are ripe and if you see this kind of stuff going on it looks kind of like a plastic bag caught in the grass uh, if you're just like driving really quickly down the highway but if you see it and you notice it and you look and it's like oh that's not a plastic bag that's how you can start to find little populations of zazote milkweed because they're they're really everywhere antelope horns milkweed asclepius asperula is the next most common milkweed as identified on iNaturalist. 
it's uh, it's got a rather showy flower. You know, Asclepius uh, anathroides has a more common milkweed flower with the tiny little reflex petals and large hoods. But this one's got really big hoods, but it's also got really big petals. And when they all bloom, they make that nice cream colored uh, kind of greenish flower that's rather intricate and pretty cool. But they've got linear leaves and the plant sprawls kind of along the ground. So it'll make several stems, but they all kind of grow just right through the grass along the ground. You know, sometimes they'll get a little bit of height to them, but they'll generally be under a foot tall whenever they're uh, fully done. And again, these ones kind of come right through the middle of the county. They're not really found too much in the southern southern part. This is, you know, they, they enjoy a little bit rockier soil, a little bit thinner soil. Um, you can see where they grow in Texas, which is kind of, you know, in the western part down towards the coast. But they're, they're a little bit more widespread because they go all the way up to Idaho. So as far as uh, milkweeds go, they have a little bit wider range than Asclepius anathroides. The antelope horns milkweed are a little bit more uh, widespread. And they have really cool bumpy uh, follicles. You can see their fruit have these interesting little horns, uh, on, you know, kind of like sticking off of the, the skin is not smooth, let's just say that. And what's kind of fun about them is where they get their common name is you can kind of see how they look kind of like little, uh, like little horns. And so when there's the stems grow along the grass, and then the horns kind of stick up out of the grass. So it looked like a little herd of antelopes was sitting out in a field if there's a whole bunch of them together. And so that's where the common name comes from, is that uh, you know, supposed likeness to antelopes grow, uh, sitting in a field. So too, the little horns look like they're sticking up out of the grass. And here's their leaves. You know, They have this kind of very linear shape, and they come off of a stem that grows right along the ground. The next most common milkweed of Guadalupe County is green milkweed, also sometimes called green antelope horns. Uh, its Latin name is Asclepius viridis. Viridis means green. It's got uh, very similar flowers to antelope horn milkweed, except the reflex petals are long enough that they stick up past the hoods. So you can see the hoods are a little bit smaller and the petals are a little bit longer. So they look... Uh, a little different, even though they are rather similar in uh, in shape to the antelope horns. The leaves are also a little bit more oval shaped, and the plant itself stands up a little bit taller. So they can get up to like three feet tall. Uh, sometimes they grow along the ground, but a lot of times they'll get a little bit of height to them. So it's one of the taller native milkweeds of this area. And you can see it's only in this eastern little bit, or sorry, <laughs> western little bit, of Guadalupe County, but anywhere that you have heavy clay soil, you might find Asclepius viridis. So you know, anywhere in here there might be some. Just because there's not a, uh, just because there's not an observation of them, doesn't necessarily mean they won't uh, be there. It just means that someone hasn't seen them on iNaturalist yet. And you can see there are widespread species of eastern Texas. So that kind of grows in the eastern third of Texas, all the way up uh, the Great Plains and into, you know, like Missouri and stuff like that. So it's a rather, again, it's another widespread milkweed species that the monarchs really like. And here's a picture of the follicles and again of the leaves. So the follicles are rather large. They're kind of puffy. They're one of the larger follicles of native milkweeds of this part of Texas. And uh, the leaves, again, are more oval shaped, kind of leathery. They're thick, they're thick leaves. and they're that nice dark green color with the uh, bold white veins. So wan milkweed is a rather rare to find, but rather widespread milkweed species. And again, it's got, uh, the hoods are the, the majority, the main part of the flower. They're the part of the flower that kind of gives it its showy appearance. You can see the petals themselves are tiny and reflexed, but the hoods stick up really far and make kind of like a little conical flower shape. And what's really cool about them is that they're, they all, they've just started blooming right now. So they only bloom in the hottest part of the summer, which is why they're kind of rare to find. Because unless you want to be traipsing around out in the full sun with the hot sun beating down on you in the middle of August and July, you're not going to see these guys blooming. Uh, they, every once in a while, but you can find them blooming in uh, June if, if one gets started rather early. 
but they're called called wand milkweed because they grow one one or two stems up maybe like three or four feet so they can actually get pretty tall and uh but they generally only have one or two stems per plant and then they get these really big clusters of flowers so it looks kind of weird because it's a, like this tiny like little stem with all these big leaves and these giant flowers up on top uh, it's one that I really like so if you if you take the time and brave the heat it's one that's really rewarding to grow uh, and you can see it grows it's a, it's a white another widespread milkweed species and this is kind of the southern range uh, but it grows in uh, pretty much anywhere in Guadalupe County, but there's only two, three locations where people have actually spotted it, taken pictures, and posted it to iNaturalist. But it'll grow uh, pretty much anywhere in your county if you can find a if you can find a population to collect some seeds off of. It's got rather variable uh, leaf shape, so sometimes they'll be nice big ovals. Other times they'll be a little bit more narrow, and then sometimes they can be almost linear, especially when they're young. The ones that I sprout when they're very young, they'll have uh, linear leaves. And I'll ha I have a sample I'll show you in a second. But they always have this little ring of veins that run parallel to the outside leaf margin. So they've got the central vein, and then they've got all the little, vein the little veins that go out. But then they've got a ring that runs right along the leaf margin. So that's they're the only one that's like that in Texas uh, that I know of anyway, uh, in this part of Texas anyway. And then their fall cells are very smooth and they generally ripen as the leaves fall off the plant. So they're very hard to find uh, if you haven't seen them blooming because they're, it's literally just a little stick and then a tiny little fossil sticking off the stick. And even though it looks like the plant's dead, it's slowly ripening up that fruit. And then, you know, at the end of August or maybe at the beginning of September, those uh, fossils will split. And so it's... Uh, kind of imperative that you find it before it's uh, developing. When it's blooming, they're easier to see because they have those giant flowers that kind of stick up above the grass. Uh, so this is one you'll have to kind of come back to again and again. Texas milkweed deserves a uh, special mention. It's a milkweed that grows in the Texas hill country, but it's kind of cool in that it grows in the shade. All the other ones that we've talked to about before are really full sun plants or partial shade plants. But if you have full shade, which a lot of people have in their residential yard, Texas milkweed is one to plant because it likes the full shade. In nature, it grows in the shade of junipers and oak trees. And it's got a very showy white flower that I enjoy looking at. And so if you have uh, full shade, this is one to plant. I've got it growing in my yard in the shade of a pecan tree, and it seems to like that well enough. So it doesn't have to grow in the hill country, just n n in nature, that's where it grows. And you can, I, I, there's not one uh, posted yet for Guadalupe County, but it is uh, in Bear County where I live. And you can see it kind of grows up here in the hill country section of Bear County. But there's a couple people who have it growing in their yards and they've posted those on iNaturalist too. So you can see that it grows in nature up here in the hill country, but down here where the soils are a little bit deeper, it can, it can do just fine uh, in a residential landscape setting. And here's its range map. It's got a very restricted range. It's Some people call it a Texas endemic, but it does actually grow in, uh, in northern Mexico down here. Uh, but it's, it's got a very restricted range, and it's a, just a really cool plant. And it grows in the hill country and out in Big Bend and adjacent uh, parts of Mexico. So it's a really cool plant. And it grows in the shade, which is also awesome. Another uh, kind of rare milkweed of Guadalupe County is world milkweed. So all the other milkweeds that we've talked about have opposite leaves. So the leaves come up opposite each other on the stem, whereas world milkweed has little whorls of leaves that come out together. So like four or five leaves together where they come out of on the stem. It also has a cute little white flower that you can see there. And there's actually only one recorded observation uh, on iNaturalist, and that's down here in the sand area. You know, they, it likes to grow under uh, post oaks and blackjack oaks and things like that. So if you have those kinds of trees growing in your yard, this is one of the milkweeds that you can grow uh, and will actually thrive in your yard, whereas everybody else is going to be having trouble 
uh, it won't grow in say like deep clay or the rocky soils necessarily too well, but in nice uh, loose sand it does really well. Same is true of butterfly milkweed. This is one kind of more of an East Texas plant, but Guadalupe County is right on the western um, edge of its natural range. And you can see there's only, again, there's only one location where someone has spotted one in Guadalupe County. And it's got maybe the showiest of the native milkweed flowers for Texas. It's got those bright brick red flowers. This is one I found up in North Texas. But it's kind of cool in that it actually is the only milkweed species that I know of that doesn't have milk sap. So when you break its stem, nothing comes out. It's not, it, even though it is in the genus Asclepius, because it has those flowers and it makes a fall of sill, uh, it doesn't have milk sap. Monarchs will eat it. I've seen, there's plenty of pictures of monarchs on this plant, uh, if you look at it online. Uh, and I had a friend who grows it in his yard and he has monarchs visit it in the spring, but for whatever reason, it doesn't make the milk sap. Milkweed vines, there's also milkweed vines. They're not in the genus Asclepius, and monarchs don't generally use them as host plants, but they are in the milkweed family. And these are a couple that you might find in parts of Guadalupe County. We've got plateau milkweed vine, which only grows in the Edwards Plateau. And we've got the more widespread pearl milkweed vine, which grows pretty much all over Guadalupe County. It's got these cool little metallic centers that look just like little pearls. The plateau milkweed vine doesn't have the pearl. You can see it's got like a little uh, green center, but it's still a cool vine. And the plateau milkweed vine is a Texas endemic species, so it only grows in a very restricted part of Texas. Then we've got other milkweed vines. These are both in the genus uh, Finastrum. And these ones, the monarchs don't use, but I have seen queen butterflies lay their eggs on uh, these two vines. One of them is called climbing milkweed vine, the other one's called uh, tayalote, and this one has the biggest fall cell of any of the Texas milkweeds. It's like, like it's a honking giant fall cell like that, and so when a bunch of them grow on a tree, they're quite uh, striking, and you can see them from far away. Uh, really cool little plant. This one's got very pretty little pink flowers. These one's flowers are actually tiny, and then it makes this giant pod, uh, so it's kind of fun in that respect. We've also got other uh, milkweed vines. There's this one's a purple milkweed vine. It has that cool little purple flower, and then it makes a really large uh, follicle, and it grows maybe like two or three feet long, but it's always just right along the ground, and it grows maybe in like a little like spokes on a wheel, just out from a central location. And they make these really interesting little follicles. I've got one here that I found in the grass. And see how it has that hole through it? So some little bug got in there and ate up all the seeds. So the plant uh, dumped the, the fruit before it was uh, ripe. And so this one's maybe about a quarter the size of what they get. So they generally get maybe about that much longer and like, like that much wider. So they get really large. And these ones, they bloom in the spring. It takes all year for it to grow, and then you can find them uh, split open in like October. So it's it takes quite a bit of patience, uh, but it's kind of fun too, because they're just a very strange little plant. And then of course the really cool part about milkweeds is that they are like a little ecosystem all in of themselves, and a lot of the things that eat them are insects that have specifically evolved along with them. Uh, to be able to ingest the poison. So, you know, it's kind of like a little arms race. The milkweeds become more poisonous, and the, the bugs gain immunity to the poison, and then the milkweed becomes more poisonous, and then, so they're kind of ramping up. And uh, so we've got, like, milkweed tussock moths. we got queen butterflies. This one is a longhorn milkweed beetle, and we've got uh, milkweed bugs. Is what those are. And you notice they're all kind of brightly colored. And this is actually a little bit of a defense mechanism for them. Because they can ingest that poison and they take the poison into their own tissues, anything that eats them is going to ingest that poison too. And so it tastes really nasty for like birds and little critters to eat these bugs, and so they don't do it. So they might eat one 
and then they learn their lesson. And so that's why they're brightly colored like this, is that they try to keep themselves, uh, they, they announce their presence to their potential predators and say, like, I'm nasty, don't eat me. And so after they, like, each bird has to eat at least one to figure out that it's nasty. But once that bird learns that lesson, they're not going to repeat the problem again. And so each one of these guys, they eat the milkweed and ingest the poison and then take that poison with them for the rest of their life, which is kind of kind of a cool little quirk of nature. Uh, and of course, the uh, flowers themselves are also a really great source of nectar. You can see beetles. We got beetles. We got bees, butterflies, and even wasps love the nectar on milkweed flowers. Uh, so it's, they're just, whenever they're in flower, there's tons of insects all over the flowers. And uh, they just look really uh, kind of cool. So if you ever see one blooming, hang around for a little while and you'll see a whole bunch of different things uh, stop by for that nectar. And then of course, the thing that most people are uh, aware of is the monarch butterfly. It's the only, only plants in the genus Asclepius are monarch butterfly host plants. So the monarch has to have a milkweed to complete her life cycle. You know, she has to lay her eggs on a milkweed and the there has to be enough milkweed there for that little caterpillar to eat enough and then to go through its metamorphosis and you know keep the keep the species alive and so this is you know it's the reason why most of you i'm sure are interested in milkweed uh, and then this is a bunch of different uh, monarchs on different kinds of native texas milkweeds so here's one on a antelope horn milkweed you can see it's eating the flower itself which is kind of fun this one's a monarch on texas milkweed and we've got a monarch there's the mother, and she's laying these eggs, these little tiny cream-colored eggs, on the zizote smokeweed leaves. And I have a bunch of zizotes at my house, so sometimes I'll uh, capture a little caterpillar after it's hatched. And you can grow it uh, up to full size if you have enough milkweed on hand to just keep feeding it. And so sometimes it's kind of fun to watch it happen. I don't do it that much anymore, but when I was first starting out, it was really fun to do. Uh, but I like letting them be wild, you know, hanging outside and, uh, you know, going through the whole process. So a lot of them do get eaten, even though they are poisonous uh, to whatever eats them. I guess, you know, uh, ladybugs can eat them because they, they actually can eat the aphids, too, that eat milkweed. Uh, so ladybugs apparently have a little bit of uh, resistance to the poison. But anyway, you know, it's, it's, it's all part of evolution, right? Collecting the seeds is a uh, another important part of uh, if you want to grow it yourself and that's going to be kind of tricky because milkweed pods if you get there on the wrong day they're completely empty and if you get there too soon if the if the pod isn't ripe and, and you collect it it won't have none of those seeds will uh, be viable and so if you try to sprout them they'll all be uh, nothing will sprout you actually have to wait until you see the little telltale sign of this little crack start forming down the follicle. And then you can peel it back and you notice all those seeds in there, how nice and brown and dark brown they look. If you if you go ahead and like pop one open and it's not ready, those seeds inside will be like cream color or you know very pale and they that none of them will be viable. You have to wait until it actually pops open. So if you have like a big patch that you're watching, you might be able to just show up on a random day, like I did with this one. I just showed up, and you know this one was gone, and you know maybe like six or seven other ones were gone, and this one happened to be just splitting open. So I was able to collect a few of the seeds out of that follicle, uh, just because the patch was so big. But say you have a tiny little patch and it only has one follicle, you might want to put a bag or something over that pod, so you don't uh, miss the day, because you know if you come too late, all the seeds will be gone. You know, so when when it's fully split open, you know, it starts to spill out the seeds, and when it's like this, it's very hard to collect. It's not impossible. You know, you can sort through all that nasty, because, uh, you know, those little silks get all gummy with the milkweed sap, and you're, like, trying to fiddle them with it. it. It can be a lot. But if you come too late, all the seeds will be completely gone. So you want to you wanna plan your timing, you know, keep an eye on it, keep a close eye, or put a bag over it. This is a YouTube video. Let me close this. Uh, this is a YouTube video that I put together about how to collect good seed of milkweeds. Because a lot of times, even though the pot will be open and the seed looks like it's sitting right in there looking all nice and good, the good seed will be gone. If, if a pod's open and you can reach inside 
and like all the seeds are just sitting there, that's almost always an indication that the pod uh, opened up either like the plant just decided to uh, abort the pod because sometimes they will if it's too hot or say a lot of bugs got on there and started eating on it this the pot will just split open prematurely and uh, all those seeds because they're not quite ripe will just sit there in the pod and they look like they're ready for you to pick them up and sprout them but none of those seeds are going to be viable so one of the things that you want to look for is if there's a lot of milkweed bugs on the pod uh, and, it, and the seeds are still inside there, that actually may be a good indication that that's a freshly opened pod and that the bugs are there to eat the seeds. <laughs> so if you can kind of brush the little bugs away and grab those seeds out of there, that's that's one indication. The other indication is if, you know, it's just barely open and the seeds look nice and dark inside. Uh, or you can see one that's like all through the grass and those those seeds will probably be good too. But if it's just open, there's no bugs on there and the seeds are just sitting there, kind of crispy looking, then they're not uh, going to be good. Here's a good, uh, here's a picture, should I say. This is a picture of good milkweed seed. You can kind of see there's like a little bump in the middle, especially on that one. If you, if you hold them in your fingers, so I've got a seed here, you can, you can see they're rather flat, but if you kind of hold them in your finger and you feel like there's a little, uh, just like a little bump in the middle, you know that that little bump is, that's the actual living part of the seed. If you if you take them in your fingers and you squish them like that, and it feels kind of flat and uh, like paper all the way through, then that's probably not good seed. Good seed's gonna be dark brown. It's gonna have that nice little bump in the middle and it's not going to crumble. A lot of times, you know, if you put, if you rub it between your fingers, they'll crumble the dust. That's obviously not a good seed. The way that you, a lot of people will tell you to sprout milkweed seeds is through cold stratification, or some, some people call it vernalization. But this is a way to like trick the seeds into thinking that they've gone through a cold winter. And then the idea is that after you take them out of the refrigerator, they uh, think that they've gone through winter and they sprout immediately. So what you do this way is uh, you take some vermiculite or like perlite or something and get it kind of moist to get the seeds thinking like they're in moist soil. You don't want it, if you squeeze it, you don't want water to run out the bottom, but you want it to kind of hold its shape like it is in the picture. That means that it's moist enough, but not too moist. And then you uh, toss it in a plastic baggie. I was, I was doing a little experiment, so I was counting up how many seeds I had in each bag uh, to see what the germination rate would be. But you toss them in the bag, you, have all, you get all of them all together and you pop them in your refrigerator for, you know, between uh, two weeks and 35 days. Some people say 35 days. And then after you take them out, you put them in whatever container you want to sprout them in, and then you're good to go. Uh, you know, water them until they sprout. Another way to do it, this was the other uh, example of what I was trying to do in my little experiment. I was going to see if it was important to cold stratify or if I could just kind of soak them overnight. So what I did was I took, you know, I, I took my little seeds, put them in a cup, poured water over them and let them set overnight before I put them into the pot to sprout them. And it turns out there's not that much of a difference between the rate of germination if you uh, soak them overnight or if you put them in the fridge for 35 days. So a lot of times, so why, why do cold stratification is kind of my thinking. And the reason I think that most people say that you have to do cold stratification and, and definitely the reason why uh, people started doing it is because most of the milkweed research has been done on common milkweed from like Minnesota. And so that, that seed goes through a very hard winter, right? But down here in South Texas or, you know, South Central Texas, you're not really going to be getting, you know, cold, cold winters. And a lot of the plants sprout in the fall anyway, after the summer. So, you know, they, the, in nature, they're not going through these cold winters and you don't have to trick them into going uh, through a winter for these South Texas uh, varieties. The easiest method is really just take the raw seed, freshly collected seed, and just take like a four inch pot, fill it with the soil that you want to grow it in. So if you're going to grow this for your yard, just dig up a pot of soil from your yard. And uh, all you have to do is, I've got another YouTube video. This goes, that's the link to the YouTube video. It goes through the whole process. But basically you take the seed, and you can kind of see how they have like a small end 
and a wide end. Well, the wide, the wide end you hold it by, and the small end is the end that the, the root, the first little radical is going to come out of the seed from that small end. And so you can just take the pot of soil, take it with the small end down, and just kind of use your finger to pop it in the soil. And just kind of dust some soil over the top. You really don't need to bury it much more than that. And then all you have to do is water it for you know, the first uh, week or so. Generally, that if it's fresh seed, it'll sprout in the first week. Just water it every day until it sprouts. And then uh, after that, you don't have to water it so much. You know, you want to let it uh, kind of dry out in between waterings because it is it is a native plant, and it's way easier to kill it by overwatering it than, uh, than by underwatering it because it, it'll produce a very long root. You know, even before it produces its first few leaves, the root will be like maybe it'll like it'll the root before it produces its first few leaves, it'll be down at the bottom of this little pot. So you really don't have to keep it all that moist after after it sprouts. And then, you know, after a while, you'll move it either to a bigger pot to keep an eye on it, or you can put it directly in the ground from like a four inch pot. One thing about planting is they, they, in nature, they grow with grasses. They grow mixed in with a bunch of different stuff. And I've noticed that a few, like Texas milkweed's a little different. It can grow very well in a mulched bed, but like zazotes and uh, antelope horn milkweed don't really like to be planted in a flower bed with like mulch and be kept very nice and neat. If you have like a little area where you have some native grasses or something like that, if you can put the milkweed in with them, it'll do a lot better than a, a mulched flower bed. But yeah, the easiest method is just to put it right in the soil and uh, get it going. So this is this is the results from my little experiment. The ones up front were the ones I soaked overnight, and the ones in the back were the ones that I put through cold stratification. So this one took about 24 hours, that one took about three weeks. Uh, and you can see there's not really much difference what I did notice is that these sprouted within like the first day, almost all of them, and these ones took maybe four or five days to sprout. So the question is, do you want to spend all that time with cold stratifying and taking up fridge space and all that kind of stuff, or do you just want to water it for a little bit longer before they sprout? For me, it's clear. Just don't, don't cold stratify. Uh, it, the other part of keeping monarch migration going is fall nectar plants. So, you know, the part of the migration, the very first generation in the spring is born here in Texas, and then it migrates north, and successively they go all the way up to Canada eventually. And then in the fall, the fourth monarch generation, uh, something switches in their mind and they come back down, and on their way to Mexico to overwinter, what they really need in Texas is fall nectar plants. And so uh, this is cowpin daisy. So it's a great fall nectar plant. It blooms all, you know, all all summer and then into the fall, and especially when monarchs are moving through. And uh, it's got a, you know, it's got a bunch of little flowers packed into the disc there, so monarchs can drink a lot of nectar at once and then keep flying. This one on the right is a is a common roadside weed called Baccarus neglecta. Some people call it poverty weed. Roosevelt weeds another common name for it. Some people just call it Baccarus. Uh, but again. It's got a very dense little flower with a bunch of flowers all packed in there at once. And then look on each little stem, there's a flower. So it's a very, it's a very calorie dense little plant. And it's a big, actually it's a big shrub that's just covered in flowers. So a monarch migrating through can stop at that one plant and drink a ton and then keep going. And so little asters like this that bloom in the fall are really good for monarch butterflies. So if you have Baccarus, in like a waste area, don't chop it down. If you have a uh, cowpin daisy, encourage it. And these are these are things that you can really do to help the migrating monarchs because they need that fuel source to get them all the way to Mexico. And that's really the most important part of the migration in Texas is the fall nectar plants. That's what they really need. The other thing you can do to help uh, conserve monarchs is to register your habitat. Once you get milkweeds growing, you can do, make your home landscape, a monarch way station. Uh, you can also, you know, certify it through the National Wildlife Federation and things like that. And this lets people know, uh, you know, what you're trying to do with your yard. You can see it. Mine's kind of wild back there. I have the side yard that I let go kind of crazy. Uh, but it's good for monarchs. And uh, 
my neighbors like it too. <laughs> but if you can if you can buy those signs, it also it promotes conservation in general, and it helps uh, those uh, conservation organizations too. So there's a, another little, this one is not a native milkweed, but it's probably the one that's most common in nurseries. Not probably, it is the most common milkweed in nurseries. And uh, it's actually a milkweed from further south in Mexico, and it doesn't go dormant during the winter. And so when we don't have a very cold winter, these plants can get, grow all winter long. And so, you know, if we don't have a freeze, these plants will be present. And monarchs, instead of making the normal migration all the way down to Mexico, they're, they're gonna stick around here and uh, try to complete their life cycle during the winter. Now say it's like December, you know, 29th, and uh, a monarch's just laid her eggs on this milkweed, they all hatch, and then in early January, we do get a freeze. Well, then all those, that, that monarch mother, instead of going down to Mexico, has doomed all of her uh, larva to uh, a premature death. And so this, this one is very important, if you have it, to cut it down and keep it cut down throughout the winter because it can interrupt. Uh, you definitely want to do it when they're migrating. So, you know, starting in October, you want to keep it trimmed to the ground until March just to prevent monarchs from getting trapped here over winter. And uh, another thing that uh, changes the monarch behavior is that monarchs will lay hundreds of eggs on one uh, tropical milkweed plant, whereas in nature, they tend to lay two or three per plant. So the, the young are spread out over an entire field instead of uh, all being concentrated on a few plants. And so when they're concentrated like that, they tend to get uh, this parasite uh, called OE, and you can Google all that, but it's because basically they're they're all concentrated in one little location. And just like people, when we're all packed to, into one location, we can spread diseases between ourselves a lot easier than when we're all spread out. So, you know, talking about social distancing, there's no social distancing on tropical milkweed, and so monarchs uh, tend to suffer. You know, if you're, and, and what's interesting is we're actually breeding monarchs by using tropical milkweed, uh, in a way, because, you know, in the wild, they're all spread out, and so the the pressures of evolution are different. You know, they, they're trying to grow very fast, and they're trying to get very large, but when they're all packed together on tropical milkweed, what we're actually selecting for is our butterflies that are very good at uh, resisting the parasite, and that means smaller butterflies that uh, can grow rather quickly, and uh, you know, resist that parasite. And so what we're doing is we're, we're actually changing the, we're breeding butterflies that are more colonial in nature instead of having the majestic large butterflies that are all kind of loners. Uh, so it's kind of an interesting, you know, thought experiment. A lot of people say just deal with it, but, you know, we there are consequences to uh, our actions. And really in, in Texas, the weak link in the chain is more along the lines of fall nectar plants. We actually have a lot of native milkweeds that grow in the wild and but monarch butterflies can go out there. So you have to ask yourself, what uh, what's your goal? If your goal is just to produce the most monarchs no matter what, no matter if it's better for the monarchs or better for, you know, then tropical milkweed will produce way more per acre than the native milkweeds. But if your goal is to have a nice majestic wild butterfly, native milkweeds are, in my opinion, the way to go. Uh, so they look kind of similar to the butterfly milkweed, but they generally have a two-tone flower. Uh, the, the butterfly milkweed is always going to have just the one brick red flower. Uh, they've bred this one to be yellow as well, all yellow, and they've bred ones that are all red. But they have the two-tone flower in general. Their leaves don't have hairs on them. So if you notice, the butterfly milkweed has hairy stems and hairy leaves. The tropical milkweed is hairless. Sometimes they sell tropical milkweed, as butterfly milkweed in nurseries. So it's better to know what you're buying. And so if it has hairs, then it's native. If it's hairless, it's non-native. So I got to my little question section, which uh, that's how you get uh, questions to me, is my email address there. And then uh, I also am on Instagram as Prairie Rambler. I take pictures of native plants and native bugs and stuff. But this is also the section of the milkweed show and tell. So we've got a little, uh, this is a, a zote smokeweed here, 
And I, I brought this one in particular because look, it's got half of it's dead, right? And so at first, you know, this stem was going just fine this spring. When the summer hit, I missed a couple waterings and this stem died. But you know, now that I'm watering a little bit more uh, normally, it sprouted right back. And this is something that milkweeds do all the time. They'll lose their spring leaves, they'll grow a summer set, the, the summer set will die and a fall plant will grow up. But down in this pot, there's a huge root. So even if it loses its leaves a couple times a year, it's not, uh, it's, it, this is exactly what it's meant to do. It's not uh, stressed or anything like that, it's just how it does. And then we've got a couple different milkweeds here. So this is the this is the wand milkweed, and you can see how linear the leaves are. But it may if I can get it close enough. Uh, maybe not. And then I've got the uh, this is the purple milkweed vine leaves here. They're kind of little heart shaped leaves with uh, on the little stem. But yeah, so that's. They grow well in little pots for a while, but eventually you'll want to put them in the ground. They don't bloom very well in pots. Uh, and of course, when they're in the ground, they get a lot bigger too. Anyway, if you have questions, send them on to frontporchprairie at gmail.com. I hope you enjoyed this. Bye.